السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, Welcome all to the week uh, 22nd or 22nd week of anesthesia and critical care refresher course um, and as usual we have two lectures but uh, the abnormality tonight uh, both lectures are ICU uh, topics uh, it's ICU night uh, with excellence it's ICU, uh, the first topic is the infections in ICU. ICU. So uh, the first lecture is infections in ICU or hospital acquired uh, or ICU acquired infection or hospital acquired infections leading to ICU admission. Uh, the lecture by Dr. Uh, Amr Hani Safwat. The first session moderator will be Dr. Ashraf al -Tayar. Then we'll go to the second session and myself is the moderator is of the second session and our guest speaker tonight is one of the pioneers and eminent speakers in critical care in all Egypt, uh, professor, assistant professor uh, in Ain Shams University, uh, Dr. Mohammed El Gindi. Uh, I'm just reminding you all uh, 12 days or 13 days with the critical care ultrasound updates conference with seven uh, uh, different countries origin and 14 speakers 21 different lectures carries all the updates and best modalities in icu ultrasound in critically ill patients so don't forget to register and if you did not get your registration confirmation and the email of your link of attendance please email me or whatsapp me or uh, send me uh, on the facebook uh, messenger any way of communication you prefer please let me know that you did not re receive your email yet and they immediately send you the registration link. Uh, thanks very much. And we are going straight forward now to the first speaker and first session moderator, Dr. Ashraf al -Tayar. Dr. Ashraf, you can unmute yourself and please go ahead. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much, Dr. Walid Al-Habashi uh, for this very nice uh, organization and uh, commitment with uh, continuous education for intensive care and anesthesia. Uh, as Dr. Walid said, this is, may, might be a very special night with ICU topics, two very important topics with two very important well-known uh, speakers from Egypt. I have the pleasure and honor to introduce the first speaker who is graduated from the same uh, the same year like me, Dr. Amr uh, Hani Safwat. Maybe he looks younger than me, uh, but we share the same year of graduation. Let me say, it, Dr. Amr, do you mind to say 1994 from Ain Shams University, same university like Dr. Muhammad Al Jindi, who is the second speaker tonight. Dr. Amr Hani Safwat is currently the uh, chairman of anesthesia and ICU department at three top hospital in Maldives. And he was the ex head of uh, ICU in Al Abha, Saudi Arabia, and he worked for several years, probably in, in Egypt before. Dr. Amr Hani Safwat will speak tonight about the uh, hospital acquired infections. And this is very, very important topic in, in ICU and for all working with acutely ill patient, patients to know different types of uh, uh, hospital acquired infection. I'm sure that Dr. Amr will simplify this tough topic for those who are going to have exams in ICU and in anesthesia. Without any further delay, let us welcome Dr. Amr to start his presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Amr. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, everyone, for accepting me for this uh, presentation. And I would like to uh, keep it as simple as possible. In the beginning, I, I appreciate all the effort done for this course and uh, <clears throat> sorry there is some and i thank dr ashraf tayar who is a same year graduate and of course he don't look any older than me i'm the one older. 
but uh, let's start with a topic which is not very well uh, known to everyone and it's it might be a bit difficult for some that's why we are trying as much as possible to simplify it and make it in points that will be clear to all participants and people who are going for exams. <clears throat> Hospital acquired infections. Kindly share your presentation, please, Dr. Omar. It's not, not shared? No. Okay, I'm very sorry. You know? Yeah, if you can go to the first slide, if you wish. Okay, so hospital acquired infection. What is hospital acquired infection? This are nosocomially acquired infections that are typically not present or might be incubating during the time of admission. They usually manifest 48 hours after admission with approximately 5% of all patients admitted to a hospital each year will develop an infection during hospitalization. The application of readily available, simple evidence-based preventive measures can reduce hospital acquired inf infections dramatically. Unfortunately, most of us are not very well oriented with the prevention of hospital acquired infection and the methods of patient care and hand hygiene and like this are not very well followed up. So please, we need to be very strict with this measures of prevention to decrease the magnitude of this very big problem of hospital acquired infection that is affecting many of our patients each year. So this is a nice slide showing the percentage of hospital acquired infection. It's showing that many of the infections can be prevented, the surgical site infections, like catheter-associated UTI, central line-associated bloodstream infection, VAP, which is our main site of concern, we, we as all intensivists and, and anesthesiologists, VAP is our main area and other infections that we can deal with. So, why hospital acquired infection in the ICU have very special situation? Because patients admitted to the ICU are very susceptible to infection due to their compromised immune and nutritional status. We are using usually invasive devices for hemodynamic monitoring, like central venous lines, like uh, uh, arterial lines, like catheters, like all this. And the ongoing exposure to antimicrobial resistant flora within the hospital, which is the one that until now cannot be eradicated, that all hospitals are area of potential infection. What are the common types that we are dealing with? Ventilator associated pneumonia, VAP, device associated infection as catheter related bloodstream infections, catheter associated UTI, surgical site infection, and the new one, clostridium difficile infection. Let's start with the <clears throat> one that we are mostly attached with ventilator associated pneumonia. Ventilator associated pneumonia is a form of hospital acquired pneumonia, which develops 48 to 72 hours after endotracheal intubation. Most of, some of the centers now are even saying it intubation associated pneumonia, not ventilation associated pneumonia because of the very close relation of endotracheal intubation and the VAP. The VAP occurs in nine to 27% of ventilated patients according to the American statistics, leading to prolonged ICU, prolonged hospital stay with increased mortality. 
what are the risk factors of that? Why it's a problem in the IC? Most important risk factor of VAP, as we said before, is the presence of an endotracheal tube, which interferes with the normal protective upper airway reflexes, which prevents effective covering, coughing, and allows microaspiration of contaminated pharyngeal, pharyngeal secretions. And the bacterial biofilm can be formed on the inner wall of the ETT, which allows microbacteria to travel through to the lungs. What are the causes of organisms in VAP? Usually, we divide VAP into two kinds. The early onset VAP, which occurs before four days of incubation, and this is called by antimicrobial sensitive pathogens, like hemophilus, like streptococcus pneumonia. And this is usually, it's more easy to treat, and it will not was very high morbidity and mortality. Late onset VAP, which is happening after four days, and usually it's caused by multi-drug resistant pathogens as acinetobacter, pseudomonas, and MRSA. The late infections is a problem that it's usually caused by multiple organisms. So, the, these organisms are multi, drug resistant, it's not easy to treat, plus they are multiple organisms adding to the magnitude of the problem, which makes it more difficult to treat and to handle. So VAP is a big, big problem in the ICU, especially nowadays when you are needing to ventilate more patients due to the current pandemic. How to diagnose VAP? There is no consensus gold standard for the diagnosis of VAP. It should be suspected when we have a <clears throat> patient, intubated, ventilated patient, with new infiltration in the chest X-ray, plus two or more of the following. Purulent tracheobronchial secretions, fever, leukocytosis or leukopenia, impaired oxygenation or ventilation, with bronchospasm or hemoptysis. All this will give us high suspicious of patient developing ventilator-associated pneumonia, and we should start seeking for proper diagnosis and treatment. So, when we suspect that we have a patient with VAP, we should take lower respiratory tract microbiological sampling should be done for proper diagnosis and management. Sampling can be invasive using the bronchoscope like bronchoalveolar lavage or tractor specimen brush or non-invasive like blind mini bell or tracheobronchial aspirin. The recent studies didn't show very big difference in the management using invasive or non-invasive methods, but still most centers prefer to use the, the invasive methods using bronchoscope for proper sampling. After sampling is taken, we will do gram stain, differential white blood cell count in the sample, and we will use either culture, either quantitative or semi-quantitative culture for diagnosing or counting the organism. The quantitative culture, we have a diagnostic threshold of in the uh, bronchial adver lavage, 10 to power four colony forming unit per unit, and in the specimen, 10 power six colony forming unit per uh, ML to diagnose or to go to high suspicion of VAP. The use of pulmonary infection score combines clinical findings as temperature, white blood cell count, oxygenation, and nature of tracheal secretions. 
radiological findings like the presence and progression of pulmonary infiltrates, the culture of the tracheal aspirate. This was adopted by some centers as a diagnostic method for diagnosis of ventilator associated pneumonia. But unfortunately, the sensitivity and specificity was very small, 59 to 60%, which is not very encouraging to uh, go on. So after taking the sample and detecting, we will diagnose and then start for treatment. Treatment of VAP, if we have early onset VAP, if we have case of no suspicions of multidrug resistant organisms, start empirical therapy with the drug uh, which have high activity against gram negative bacilli. If there is a concern about the presence of resistant gram negative bacilli, we use the Presellin Tazobactam, Cefepim, or Carbinipinum as the monotherapy is recommended. If MRSA is suspected, we can add vancomycin or linezolid. Therapy should be adjusted according to the culture results after two or three days. We can decelerate, we can increase, we can change according to what we will find in the culture. And the recommended duration of therapy is usually seven days. <clears throat> How to prevent VAP? Prevention of VAP is easy if we follow the guidelines, perform regular oral care with chlorhexidine, subglottic drainage of tracheal secretion using speci specially designed endotracheal tubes, elevation of the head of the bed 30 degrees, Maintenance of the ATT cuff pressure to decrease aspiration as much as possible. Minimize the duration of intubation and try to avoid re-intubation. Use non-invasive ventilation as much as we can when it's possible. Selective decontamination of the GIT and use of probiotics. All of these measures can help decrease the incidence of VAP dramatically. VAP is a big problem in the intensive care unit. It is one of the causes of high morbidity and mortality. Avoiding it is very important to decrease the incidence of VAP. Second problem that we will deal with tonight is intravascular catheter-related bloodstream infection. This is also an important cause of morbidity and mortality in the ICU. It can be caused by, due to any intravascular uh, access method, but it's most probably seen with central venous catheters. What are the risk factors of developing uh, into the, uh, catheter-related bloodstream infection. Number one is catheter factors. The catheter location, it was well said before for a long time that the femoral root increases the rate of infection. But in the recent studies, it was not confirmed and not proved that it, it is different rate of infection on other sides of the infection. Tunnel catheters show less rate of infection. The quality of the catheter site care is very important the, during insertion and after insertion. Catheter inserted in emergency situation with an inexperienced personnel are more likely to develop catheter-related bloodstream infection. Good sterilization of the site, good hand hygiene, 
good barriers during insertion of the catheters will decrease the rate of infection dramatically. So please follow this. Please don't take it lightly, insertion of central line. Don't take lightly the sterilization and the good hygiene during the insertion because it really makes a difference when you do it. What are the host factors that cause uh, infection, immune suppression, neutropenia, burnt patients, patients of malnutrition, and extremes of age patients? All this can lead to increased the rate of infection. Microbiological factors coagulase negative staph, staph aureus, enterococci, E. coli, and candida species. All this are the organisms that we usually see during the bloodstream infection in these patients. How to diagnose catheter-related bloodstream infections? In the ab absence of another apparent sources, when bloodstream infection occurs in the presence of a central venous catheter, catheter-related bloodstream infection should be suspected. Fever is sensitive but non-specific sign. Virulence or inflammation at the insertion site is specific but insensitive. Blood culture should be done, taken from two sites. One site of them is the catheter itself, take from one of the uh, lines and take from a peripheral vein in another uh, site. Diagnosis is confirmed when the same organism is, de is defined at the two sites. Culture results can be either quantitative, considered positive when calling uh, count from the catheter is three times from the colony count from the periphery or can be semi-quantitative showing more than 15 colony forming units of the same organism on both sides. So we need to confirm the infection at positive blood culture at both sides from the central line and from the peripheral vein to diagnose properly our infection. Treatment. The catheter should be removed if there is severe sepsis or hemodynamic instability. Or if there is high risk of reinsertion due to any problem in the patient, we can change it on a guide wire. But remove the catheter if there is any problem, if any sepsis, or any hemodynamic stability, don't keep the catheter please. Of course, if any peripheral catheter shows signs of infection, it should be removed immediately. Empirical therapy should be started with vancomycin. This is the empirical therapy of choice. For patients with sepsis or neutropenia, it is wise to add an anti pseudomonas antibiotic. Therapy should continue from 10 to 14 days, with considering day one is the first day of negative blood culture. Empirical therapy for suspected candidemia should be administered when sepsis is seen in immunosuppressed patients. If there is any suspicious for candidemia in immune suppressed patients, start empirical therapy against candidemia until there is positive cultures for fungi. Third point we'll talk about today is catheter associated urinary tract infection. The prevalence of catheter associated UTI in the ICU is between 8 to 21 percent, which is a very high rate. The presence of urinary catheter is greatest risk for development of UTI. Colonization of the catheter surface may lead to formation of a biofilm pathogenic organism will travel and can be a source of infection and increased mortality in ICU. So urinary catheters are a potential source of UTI if not inserted properly and under aseptic conditions, which is something usually not very followed when we are working in the ICU or during emergency situations, the, the antiseptic 
precautions are not very high. What are the risk factors? Female sex, longer duration of catheterization, and higher severity of illness. What are the microbiological factors? Usually monomicrobial, most common is E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosae, and Candidia. <coughs> The signs and symptoms of ester-related UTI include new onset or worsening fever, rigors, the case mental status, lethargy, without another identifiable cause, acute hematuria, pelvic discomfort. Urine culture should be done before starting the antibiotics, move the caster, start empiric therapy with third generation phallosporins or fluoroquinones, and gram positive cocci should be treated with vancomycin. Treatment should last for 10 to 14 days according to the American guidelines. <clears throat> surgical site infection. Most surgical site infections develop between the fifth to 10th post-operative day. What are the patient's risk factors? Advanced age, obesity, diabetes mellitus, poor nutrition, smoking, altered immune response, high acid classification, and sterilization with microorganisms. What are the causative organisms that cause surgical site infections? Usually aerobic gram positive cocci. Diagnosis, we have to make blood and wound culture. Treatment, incision and drainage of infected wound. Antibiotics are not routinely recommended if adequate drainage and local wound care can be performed. Antibiotic, antibiotics should be given if there is surgical site infection related systemic infection or deep space or an organ involved in the infection. We start empirical antibiotics waiting for the culture results, and then General measure, measures to decrease, decrease hospital-acquired infections, good education of healthcare workers, proper hand hygiene is a must in performing any procedure. Anytime you touch the patient, please perform good hand hygiene. This is very important. The percentage of following this rule is not very high, and this is a big problem because hand hygiene is the proved method of decreasing all hospital acquired infection. Use of chlorhexidine based antiseptic for skin preparation. This was a very brief and very concise presentation of the hospital acquired infections. This is, was done for exam purpose for people who will take this as guidelines for studying. I hope that it's, it was useful for some of you. I thank you so much for your attention and I hope that we we'll meet again soon, inshallah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashraf. Thank you so much, Dr. Walid. Hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, Dr. Trump. 30, 30 minutes, exactly. <laughs> great. That, that's, that's very great to cover all these topics. How actually <laughs> I see you in a matter of 30 minutes. So it was very concise to the point. Uh, but let us take some questions. Uh, I think yes, we sir. have 10 minutes, uh, Dr. Walid, for the next uh, speaker, Dr. Al-Jindi, to start. So we can just have some questions. I have a question here from Dr. Alaeddin, who is asking a very nice, controversial, though, a question of if you have candida in urine, would you treat this or not? So the question is candiduria. Would we treat the candiduria and when? 
asymptomatic asymptomatic candidulia? He did not mention, but uh, I expect him that he is working in ICU and he find a candida in your urine for somebody who's septic. Yes, it should be treated. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, when? So, uh, would you go with uh, treating every candida in, in urine? I mean, uh, as you mentioned, if, if symptomatic, somebody's septic, and there are many, yes. many sites of candida, not only urine, and, and patient is clinically unstable, then uh, 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 if this is not colonized, probably uh, you treat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ram. Uh, le let me just highlight some important points that Dr. Ram uh, mentioned. Uh, of, of course, because of the time constraint, it was uh, limiting him uh, to mention that I, 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 don't, I don't think that Dr. Amr would disagree with me that we have to be aware in, 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 in critically ill environment uh, or ICU envi environment that uh, uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, as Dr. Amr mentioned, uh, has to be tackled in a way that we should not be deceived that every fever is a sign yes. of uh, pneumonia and not every leukocytosis is a, a, a sign of VAP. And no, we have to take a case by case, individual, uh, uh, individualize every case that, uh, as I mentioned, not every fever is infection, not every leukocytosis yes. is infection. You agree with me? So, so of course, sir. Do you come across the term recommendation of uh, giving a chance for uh, the better ways to prove that VAB is there by using the biomarkers, by using the, uh, the uh, different way of radiologic investigations? If you just highlight on this, please. Now, procalcitonin is used as a method of Diagnosing and follow up of VAP. Okay. We can uh, also the radiological follow up, the X ray follow up is yeah. very important. The patient's condition that develops is a guide also. And then the problem is VAP, if you want to cover it properly, it needs a lecture alone. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yes. For, for VAP, VAP is, is a very big, very big uh, topic, very big issue. And uh, there are many studies about VAP. The problem of VAP that there is, until now really, there is no gold standard investigation to diagnose 100%. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Dr. Yes. It, 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 it depends on many factors. One of them is to um, the clinical sense or the uh, expertise of the group or the uh, ICU team that is treating the patient is one of the main method of diagnosing VAP. But really coming, jumping to an early treatment just because of fever or just because of Leukocytosis is not very recommended. No, it's you can uh, best treatment or best uh, way is to take proper cultures and to treat accordingly. But till then, I feel it's that's what we are doing in, 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 in our ICU that dealing with the patient on an individual basis, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, this is the best way to deal. There is no solid way to go through, deal with each patient according to his status, and you can proceed then. Very good. And there is very, very nice uh, review from IDSA, uh, was published maybe three or four years back, and they mentioned clearly that we should not be following only the uh, 
the, the CBIIS or clinical pulmonary infection score alone or radiologic deterioration of X-ray or fever. So what, what to do? We, in ICU, if you suspect ventilator-associated pneumonia, then you have to go with the clinical sense. This is the latest recommendations. And you might add to this, but should not deceive you if negative, the other parameters like X-ray, like cultures, like the biomarkers, but the clinical scenarios of your patient in ICU has to make this tune for uh, the way you go with. Either you treat if there is clinical evidence of ventilator associated pneumonia, or you just ignore if your patient is clinically stable. Yes, uh, as so that, that's that's what I told. It's uh, according to the expertise and. Yeah. knowledge of the treating I totally, team i totally agree with you Ram. yeah thank you very much there is another question here coming uh, about the central line related bloodstream infection uh, from muhammad khattab and he's asking uh, did, did you mention that we have to treat for 14 days uh, yes he wants to clarify this point should we treat every central related uh, central line related bloodstream infection or this is just for fungal infections, no, 14. this is for all resistant and negative and MRSA. No, this is for resistant organisms and for fungal infection. Yeah. The simple infection can be from five to seven days. Uh, let me see if there's another question here, maybe another one. And again, again, I want to add something that for duration of therapy and for uh, when to stop, you have your parameters, the clinical parameters, improvement of the patient, you have the culture results, all this will help you in deciding when to start and when to stop the team. All what we are seeing here and all what is guidelines you have to follow it and then please use your clinical sense. You can judge. You are the best one to judge your patient in front of you. Yeah, uh, and, and, and uh, probably this is another, maybe another lecture of around yes. <laughs> minutes for how long you treat infections in ICU. You go with the short-term management or long period of management, seven versus 14 days. It's a big matter and a big dilemma in, in the literature, but to cut very short, uh, I agree with you, Tram, that there are certain indications that you have to go with extended period of time, uh, like 14 days, maybe 10 to 14 days, and there are infections that can be treated with three to five days, procalcitonin, plays a, a very good role in the literature prognosis, yes. limiting the period of exposure to uh, ethics, yeah, because unnecessary exposure to prolonged period of time with antimicrobial is the major basis for resistance in ICU. So this is, has to be sure, also again as case by case uh, discussion in ICU, and of course, in ICU, we get the opinion of, of ID consultants uh, every now and then. But for line-related bloodstream infection, I totally agree with uh, uh, my friend, Dr. Amr, that you remove the line, you give the antimicrobial, is it pseudomonas, is it fungal infection, is it multidrug resistant acinetobacter, is it what sort of, uh, of, of organism you are dealing with, and then the, the main cornerstone of management, remove the line. If your patient improves, parameters are better. Procalcitonin, if you have it coming down, CRP coming down, ESR is coming down, white cell counts is coming down. If you're brilliant, hemodynamically stable, no evidence of multi organ failure, you might decide to stop as early as five to seven days even, even you're talking about bacteremic patients. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, do I have any me missing any questions, Dr. Walid? I think we answered all the questions so far. <clears throat> As Amr said, uh, yeah, probably it needs maybe two hours to, to cover all these topics, and he very nicely covered them in a very short period of time. 
Couty, Thank you so much. Caroline, Clapsy, uh, Vab, and, and many others. So I would, I would uh, thank very much Dr. Am for this very nice uh, presentation. I think we covered all the questions so far, Dr. Ray. Do you have any comment from the panelists or from the colleagues in the uh, stage there? Uh, just one question just arrived, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, when should I remove the central line uh, and still need a treatment after removal? That's just, just arrived in the panel. Very nice question, Dr. Am. Central line should be removed when there is an infection. So to cut it short, if you need a central line with high risk, as we said, like uh, blood disorder or anything, or it's difficult for insertion, you can change the central line on the guide wire. But the infected one should be removed. Yes, if it's a, if it's a line related by the streaming yes. and the line is not precious, the organism is one of the resistant bugs, gram negative, especially Pseudomonas or ASBL Eclipsilla, Cinetobacter like this, general, Cineto, fungi. There are MRSA, there are certain organisms that we don't play with. <coughs> they are there in the culture, and you are sure that this is line related bloodstream infection. This is for my uh, colleague, junior uh, staff, uh, if you allow me to Trump, that of course, uh, of course you have to define the CLAPSI, the central catheter related bloodstream infection. So you grow the organism from the peripheral blood and from the central line at two different cultures. So you request a blood from the central line, you request blood from the peripheral line, and preferentially, so you ask the lab to, uh, to be aware that this is peripheral, this is central. And the lab has to tell you that we grow this organism, the same organism, and it was grown first from the peripheral before it grows from the central. So, uh, and if you decide to remove the line, you send the tip for culture, you find the same organism. But the bottom line is an organism that you grow it from the blood, peripherally and centrally, the same. And the one from the peripheral is grown first. This is central line blood stream infection. Then you ask yourself, this patient has a precious line, very strong uh, 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 patient tumors, patient, and they need it for chemotherapy, for TPN, for whatever it is difficult to access. Another, you can give a trial for antimicrobial and see if there is no way you have to remove it. If there is resistance of bacteremia and you have instability, and instability here doesn't mean only shock, but also, Dr. Amr, I think you agree with me that evidence of multi organ failure in septic patient is a of well, severe instability. Yes. Yeah. And then there are certain organisms that you don't play with MRSA. Sodomonas, acinetobacter, fungi that you don't play with. You have to remove the line. This is better and this is recommended from IDSA and ATS and many other societies that deal with uh, infectious diseases. Uh, any other questions? And uh, I, think I think now we need to move to the next session, Dr. Yeah, thank you very much. I was very Thank pleased. you, sir. Thank you so much. I'm very proud of uh, being with both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walid. Thank you for everybody. And make a for you to introduce our second uh, very, very nice friend, Dr. Mohammed Al-Jindi.